Welcome to EPG Patshala in Computer Science. So, this is a series of uh, lectures in computer networks. So, we have been looking at various uh, wireless technologies. So, we have been looking at uh, cellular technologies. So, we will continue with cellular technologies now. So, we will look at uh, some of the ideas that are there in the 3G, 4G and we will also look at the 5G uh, network that is being proposed. Okay. So, we will also take a look at Zigbee which is another enabling technology for another upcoming uh, area in, in networks which is called as internet of things. Okay. So, as a prelude to understanding IoT, we will also take a look at Zigbee. So, we will start off with uh, cellular and wireless that is we look at the 3G to 5G wireless technologies first, then we will move on to Zigbee. Okay. So, if you look at the evolution first from 2G to 3G as such, you will see that there is actually a 2.5G so to say that was kind of there when the transition from 2, 2G to 3G actually took place. So, there are different standards that have evolved as part of this. So, in fact, uh, there are so many different uh, terminologies that are used it is kind of difficult always to keep track of them. But once you understand what these terminologies mean, it becomes easy to understand the uh, overall evolution as such. Okay. So, we start off with uh, GSM in 2G and then moved in 2.5G to what is called as GPRS which is uh, packet uh, switching service that was, that was added and then there was the 3G uh, network that was uh, standard that was proposed. So, in 3G we actually had two different uh, technologies to use, one was based on the CDMA, so which is the CDMA 2000 standard and another was based on an evolution of the uh, edge using WCDMA, TD, SCDMA and so on which is the using the um, and the UMTS kind of uh, technologies. So, we will take a look at these first. So, the 3G um, architecture, network architecture if you look at very similar to the 2G architecture as far as the voice is concerned, right. So, you can see this. So, it is basically a voice plus data network architecture that we have. So, if you see this, this part right that is you have your multiple base stations connected to a base station controller as such connected to an MSC the mobile switching center and connected to a gateway. So, this part of it is typically almost the same as what we have in the case of 2G. Plus what we have additionally is that there is a parallel right network or um, data network as to say which will handle the data part which connects to the internet. So, this part handle is connected to the public telephone network, this part is connected to the public internet. So, this base station so to say we call it as a radio network controller, right. So, this radio network controller you can see is connected to the MSC and also to what is called as an SGSN. Now, SGSN stands for serving GPRS support node, right. So, we, we are basically making use of GPRS technology. So, it is a support, it is doing, it is doing some, some support function for this, it is called as a serving GPRS support node. This in turn is connected to what is called as a GGSN which is the uh, gateway GPRS support node. So, the gateway support node is the one that will connect to the public internet. Okay. So, the uh, voice network is unchanged and is almost same as what you have and the data network operates in parallel to that. So, that is the basic uh, idea to remember with respect to 3G when compared to 2G. Okay. Right. So, um, as we said this is your radio network controller. So, between the radio network controller and the um, um, base stations that we have, so we have a radio interface. So, this radio interface could be either WCDMA or HSPA or what is referred to as a radio access network in the case of uh, UMTS, we call it as a universal terrestrial radio access network or UTRAN, okay, that is the standard that is used. So, this part that we have here, right, that is which handles the GPRS, that is general packet radio service, that is referred, is referred to as the core network. And this core network connects to the public internet. Okay, this is the uh, overall structure that we have. Right. So let's understand how these things work with respect to UMTS. Okay. Now UMTS is a um, standard which is which stands for Universal Mobile Telecommunication Systems. So it's an upgrade basically from GSM via GPRS or Edge. So it's kind of um, it's a movement basically that has happened from GSM to GPRS or Edge and then to UMTS. And the standardization for UMTS uh, was carried out by the third generation partnership project. Okay, so, so that is a consortium of industries which is responsible for the standardization. So, different data rates are supported in UMTS 144 kilobit per second for rural, 384 kilobit per second for urban outdoor and 2040 kilobits per second for indoor and low range outdoor. And the support for what is referred to as virtual home environment or VHE which basically um, provides for personalized user profiles irrespective of the network or the terminal capabilities. Okay. So, that these are all some things that are there in UMTS. Okay. 
So, if you look at the UMTS frequency spectrum, the UMTS band as such, so we have uh, two different bands 1900 to 2025 megahertz and 2110 to 2200 for the 3G transmission. It uses FDD and WCDMA and uh, the channel spacing is 5 megahertz with a raster of 200 kilohertz. And if you look at this entire um, band that we have, you can see that this band 1900 to 1980 is there is uh, for uplink and uh, 2010 to 2000 2170 is used for uh, downlink, right. So, you have what is called as a paired um, set of channels that can be used or you can have an unpaired band that is used. So, paired would mean that you use this particular frequency for uplink and that a corresponding frequency for downlink. So, it is kind of use, it, use the uh, channels in pairs. So, this is an unpaired link that you also that in unpaired frequency band also that is available. So, if you look at the overall UMTS architecture, so you will see that uh, on this side you have your mobile station, so which will have the SIM plus the mobile equipment as such that is connected to your we said the base system right the base uh, uh, station. So, the base station you can see will have the um, BSC here we refer to it as the UTRAN right. So, in UTRAN we call this as the radio network uh, system, so you have what is called as the node B. The term that is used here is node B, node B stands for um, for the base station as such ok and that is connected to a RNC which is your radio network controller and that in turn is connected to the SGSN and the GGSN ok and it is also you can see connected to the uh, MSC or um, the, v, uh, the VLR ok which is the visitor location register plus there are other registers other databases that are maintained right you have equipment ID register the HLR authentication uh, information and so on. So, this is this comprises the network subsystem ok and this in turn will be connected to other networks through the gateway. So, you have a GMSC which is the gateway um, um, mobile switching center or you have the GGSN which is the gateway for the um, GPRS uh, switching network. So, this is how this will it is connected ok, these are the different standards that you have ok. So, if you look at this evolution from 3G to 5G ok, so let us let us look at what are the various uh, characteristics that actually have evolved. So, if you look at the data bandwidth starting from about 2 megabit per second in 3G, we move towards uh, 4G you have 2, 2 Mbps to almost 1 gigabit per second, 5G aims at providing 1 gigabit per second and higher ok. And in terms of the standards uh, in 3G we have two different standards with WCDMA and CDMA 2000. Um, here is a single unified standard that is proposed for 4G and similar same thing is uh, aimed at for 5G as well. So, in terms of technology 3G uses broad bandwidth CDMA and IP technology, IP for the data network and uh, 4G uses unified IP and seamless combination of broadband LAN, WAN, PAN and WLAN ok. Uh, 5G proposes to do the same unified IP and seamless combination of broadband LAN, w, uh, WAN, PAN, WLAN and also WWW which is wireless worldwide net access as well, web access ok. And uh, in terms of service that is provided 3G provides integrated high quality audio and video and data, 4G provides dynamic information access and also support for wearable devices and so on. 5G is expected to support for dy uh, dynamic information access as well as wearable devices with AI capabilities. So, there is a lot more that is expected of 5G uh, services. So, multiple access technology that is used predominantly CDMA, um, I mean 3G and 4G use CDMA, 5G is expected to use CDMA and BDMA where B stands for beam division multiple access where you may divide the beam into different um, areas you know and do the um, beam division multiple access as such. The core network that we have here in 3G is a packet network, 4G and 5G will work on internet. The handoff process in 3G is horizontal, in 4G you would have so we have support for both horizontal and vertical. So, what we mean by this when you say vertical is that even if you move from an 802.11 to a cellular network your uh, your technology the 5G the 4G technology will be able to make the transition from one network to another which is called as a vertical hand vertical handoff. 5G also is expected to support horizontal and vertical handoffs. Okay. So, having looked at that overall 3G to 5G um, evolution now let us look at a little bit more in detail about 4G. So, 4G if you uh, if as we saw it is supposed to su uh, support data rates of 100 Mbps to 1 gigabit per second an average at least 100 Mbps and peak rates of 1 gigabit per second um, and, it is, and it is based on the UMTS 3G technology. So, it is kind of evolution from UMTS upwards and it is optimized for all IP traffic. So, if you look at the data rates you can see from 2G where it was of, the, of very low order 
right? 4G we are moving towards 1 gigabit per second. So, that is the um, goal, right, for the 2G to 4G. These are typical data download rates that you can expect. So, the radio technologies that are used in uh, LTE, if you look at that, okay, it uses what is called as orthogonal frequency division multiplexing for the downlink and uses what is called as SCFDBM, FDMA, a single carrier frequency division multiple access for the uplink. And it also uses multiple uh, multi input, multi output, MAMO technology for enhanced throughput. So, you have many inputs and outputs through which the uh, data transfers take place. Power consumption is reduced and you have higher RF power amplifier efficiency. So, less battery power is used by the handsets. So, that is the, those are the key aspects of the radio technologies that are used in LTE. We are not going to the det details of these, but we would like to, um, you know, give you an idea of what are the various technologies that are used. Okay. So, advantage of, so of LTE, if you look at for network operators as such, so they get a very high network throughput, low latency, a plug and play kind of architecture their operating costs are low and it is an all IP network. So, it is a simplified upgrade path also from the 3G networks. So, that those are the advantage for network operators. For users, for end users, the advantages that they get would be faster data downloads and uploads and an improved response for applications and an overall uh, end improved end user ex uh, experience. Okay. So, just some uh, 2G, 3G and LTE terminology, right? There are some terms that are used, some of them are kind of equivalent. So, in what we talk of in terms of uh, uh, 2G, 3G, 3G we talked about UTRAN, right? So, that UTRAN here is referred to as EUTRAN and your SGSN uh, has an equivalent here which is called as S gateway. The GGSN has something called a PDN gateway or a P gateway and the HLR, AAA, they are all referred to by something called HSS. The VLR is handled by something called MMV which stands for uh, mobility control and so on. Okay. We know that VLR is basically used for mobility control. So, that is given a different name over here. So, uh, similarly LTE and UMTS, there are some terms that are equivalent. So, it is easy to, I mean just uh, useful to take a look at these. So, LTE uses a term called evolved packet core, okay. So, which is, which uh, the UMTS equivalent of that will be packet switched core network. So, that is your evolved packet core here. Okay. MME, this stands for uh, mobility management entity in LTE. So, UMTS equivalent of that is the SG, uh, SGSN, serving GPRS support node. The SGW, uh, this is a serving gateway um, that you have, this becomes the serving gateway uh, GPRS support node that we have here, SGSN. SGSN does this uh, function also. PGW uh, is a packet data network gateway, right, in here, this is that is the meaning of PGW. This, the equivalent of this in uh, UMTS would be the gateway GPRS support node. HSS, which is the home subscriber system, equivalent of this in UMTS terms will be home location register. PCRF here is the policy charging rule uh, function, which is the same term that is used in UMTS as well. Same thing with respect to GTP, this is used for GPRS tunneling protocol, same thing is used there. Uh, S1 bearer, this is the um, tra traffic path that you have between the E node B and the SGW. Now, there we had something called node B, here it is referred to as E node B, that is the base station as such. So, E node B and the S gateway, that is your saving serving gateway, that traffic path is referred to as a S1 bearer, here it is an LU bearer. Okay. And similarly, S5, S8 bearer is used for uh, traffic path between the SGW and the PD and GW. So, there uh, in UMTS it is called as a GNGP bearer. Okay. So, these are some of the terms that are used differently in LTE, but functions are very similar. So, you can take a look at that. So, this is what the LTE architecture would look like in terms of all these terms that we had just now, right. So, the user equipment will be connected to E node B, right. So, this is where our, uh, you have an LTE U, uh, this is the interface and radio bearer control, intercell, um, RRM connection, mobility control, all these are handled over here. All radio admission control are all handled in, in this region. On the other side now, you have your MME, remember MME is your mobility uh, management part. And uh, so, this will take care of um, idle state mobility handling, barrier control and so on. And this is connected to the SGW, this handles the mobility anchoring. This in turn we said is connected by S5, S8 interface to PGW and that is connected to the operator's IP services. So, the MME will also be connected to the HSS which will have your home loca location register information and so on. Okay. So, this is the overall LTE network architecture that we have. So, LTE versus UMTS if you look at functional uh, the, ch the changes that we have. Um, so, if you just l take a look at this. So, from GGSN we said we uh, it is it's, it's getting transformed into 
part of these functions are going to PGW and part into SGW, the PDN gateway and the serving gateway, okay, that is how that is moved. So, the mobility management is handled over here, okay. So, this is the PGW and SGW are deployed according to traffic demand, okay. And another very interesting aspect here is that if you look at this part that is from the RNC, that is the radio network controller function that you have in, uh, in UMTS. So, that is moved to the E node B in UMTS. So, this one here, so there is no central radio controller node, okay. Uh, you use only OFDM radio, so there is no soft handover and the um, operator demand to simplify that that is kind of taken care of here. Okay. And if you look at the SGSN to MME um, connection that you, I mean um, functions difference if you look at. So, in MME what we actually have is, we actually split the control plane functions and the data plane functions separately in uh, LTE. So, on, there are no user plane functions which are there handled by this MME, it is only, so only the control plane functions are handled by the MME, okay. So, typically all control information is centralized and pooled and handled by the MME, okay. And uh, the data, the um, data plane or the user plane is handled by the PGW and SGW. So, that is, those are some of the differences that we have, okay. Now, coming to 5G, right, so that was about 4G. Now, coming to 5G, there are certain uh, performance goals that have been set for 5G. So, we will take a look at those performance goals and some of the techniques that people are looking at in order to achieve these performance goals. So, um, one of the first uh, goal is in terms of the uh, data rates to be supported. So, we are expecting an average of 300 to 500 Mbps and greater than 10 gigabit per second uh, data rates and less than a 1 millisecond latency, almost 100 percent network coverage. So, you should not have places where there is no network coverage, whether it is inside a building or wherever it be. And there should be a thousand times reduction in power consumption. So, you should be able to use really, really low power uh, devices and very uh, long battery, battery usage you should get. Very high reliability in all circumstances, especially indoors. So, you are expecting what is called as the 59 reliability, 99.999 percent of reliability. Deep indoor coverage and 30 times higher device density to be supported and 10 to 100 x 100 times the number of connected devices that you should be able to support and 100 times the average data rate and significantly higher security requirements. So, these are all some of the performance goals of 5G. So, technologies that are being considered in order to support these things, okay, we are using what is called as millimeter, millimeter wave technology and massive MIMO, multiple input, multiple output technologies are being used. Another thing that is being considered is LIFI. LIFI stands for light, it is a, it's a combination of light and Wi-Fi where the idea is to use light emitting diodes to transfer data, okay, rather than using radio waves like Wi-Fi, okay. So, this is supposed to um, give even lower uh, power consumption. And then native support for technologies like IoT and M2M, IoT stands for Internet of Things, M2M is uh, machine to machine communication. And support for virtualized network functions and uh, techniques like software defined networking and uh, which are, which are new paradigms that are coming in now. And device and application specific network architecture that is you should be able to have device to device communication also taking place. Similarly, vehicle to communication. So, vehicle to everything, maybe vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to some other device, vehicle to person, whatever it be. So, those also be, um, are being considered. And it, there is um, broadcast networks are being considered, spectrum sharing and splicing, there are some uh, very interesting thoughts that are going on in that area. And the uh, service creation time also is to be reduced by 99 percent. So, how is it that that can be uh, you know achieved? So, those are some things that are that are being looked at, okay. So, that is about our uh, 5G. So, you can see that from the 3G to 5G, there is a lot of uh, evolution that has taken place and there are a lot of interesting things that are, that are happening. So, we need to keep abreast of these new technologies that are coming up, okay, and understand how we can build network systems which are using these things. So, next moving on to another uh, wireless network technology which is called a Zigbee, okay. So, cellular networks was large areas, right. So, now we are talking about Zigbee which is more of a um, small area kind of, uh, so you can look at it more as a pan kind of a network, so, you know, personal area network kind of uh, that, that type of network. So, Zigbee is actually a, a, a standard that has been designed for control and sensor networks. Uh, remember we already talked of something called Bluetooth, right. So, um, Zigbee also performs a function which is kind of similar to Bluetooth, but it was realized that Bluetooth and your WLAN 802.11 was not really suitable for certain functions. So, it was then that the Zigbee um, alliance was formed and they came up with a new standard which is called the IEEE 802.15.4 standard 
okay, for an, a new technology called Zigbee. Okay, so, it is basically operates as I said in the personal area networks space and, and for device to device networks. So, the connectivity is essentially between small packet devices. So, for the applications are typically like control of lights, switches, thermostats, appliances. So, in these cases we expect to use Zigbee. Okay. So, the Zigbee Alliance as such is basically an organization uh, of uh, a, a basically a consortium of end users and solution providers who are responsible for the development of the standard. And um, so, the, their goal basically is to define the standard for reliable, cost effective and low power wireless applications. Also developing applications and network capability utilizing this 802.15.4 packet delivery mechanism. So, that is the goal of the Zigbee Alliance as such. Okay. Now, coming to the characteristics of the uh, Zigbee network. So, it is supposed to be a very low cost network, low power consumption, low data rate, relatively short transmission range, very highly scalable, reliability provides reliability, reliable data transfer and has a flexible protocol design which can be suitable for many applications. So, these are the basic characteristics that Zigbee has. So, different applications that have been envisaged for uh, Zigbee and that are being used for uh, Zigbee as such. So, starting from consumer electronics where TV, VCR, DVD remote control, uh, PC and peripherals to connect to your mouse, keyboard, joystick and so on, home automation, uh, security, your um, uh, HVAC and then lighting, okay, or closures, all these things, toys and games for consoles, consoles, portables, educational purposes so on and the personal health care monitors, diagnostic sensors for health uh, related uh, monitoring and industrial and commercial uh, monitors, sensors, automation control and so on. So, there are a huge um, set of applications for which the Zigbee networks can be used and they are all low data rate radio devices that, that are the target. So, these devices we should be able to talk to or communicate with. So, that is the idea here. So, if you look at the protocol stack, the Zigbee protocol stack as such. So, you can see that uh, the protocol stack gives us lot of specifications starting from the physical right up to the application. So, at the physical layer we have certain standards that have been defined, then the MAC layer is uh, defined, okay, the MAC the uh, media access control layer and then the Zigbee Alliance. So, this is part of your 802.15.4 standard. The Zigbee Alliance also gives us directions for the middle layer that is for the APIs to be used, how security is to be handled and how the network is to be uh, formed whether it is a star. Um, topology or a mesh topology or a cluster tree topology, what kind of topologies are to be supported. So, these are to be handled by the Zigbee Alliance, I mean these are being suggested by the Zigbee Alliance and the application of course is left to the customer. So, if you look at the um, details of the 802.15.4 architecture that is we said that this part is the 802.15.4. So, we are looking kind of zooming into this last two layers. So, if you look at that at the physical layer there are actually two different uh, frequency bands that are provided for the physical layer. And then you have what is called as the 802.15.4 MAC media access control and support for a logical link control 802.2 on top of that other LLC also can be supported. Then there is a data link controller and then there is a networking app layer and then the Zigbee application framework on top of that. Okay. So, we will take a look at the 802.15.4 uh, functionality that is with respect to the physical layer and the MAC layer. So, physical layer functionalities if you look at um, it basically supports activation and deactivation of the radio receiver. And uh, it takes care of energy detection within the current channel. Remember, uh, energy conservation is one of the prime aspects of the 802.15.4 network. Okay. So, link quality indication for received packets, all those are handled by the physical layer. And uh, clear channel assessment for, for doing the CSMACA, that is uh, carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, that is the technique that is used. But you also have a clear channel assessment before the, um, as the access takes place. And then channel frequency selection support we have and then data transmission and reception are handled by the physical layer. Okay. So, if you look at the frame structure that is used, um, you can there is a 32 bit preamble which is used for synchronization purposes and then you have a start of packet delimiter. So, a particular pattern of 1110, 0101 is what is used as the start of packet delimiter. So, that is your synchronization header as such. So, then we have the physical layer header which consists of the uh, frame length and, uh, and there is a 1 bit reserved bit. So, 8 bits gives us the PSDU length as such and here you have your physical service, uh, physical layer data unit as such. So, this uh, can vary from 0 to 127 bytes, so that is your data field. Okay. This is the overall structure that is used. And when we talk, we said there are two different operating uh, frequency bands that are supported. Okay, so we can say two different physical layers that are supported as such. One is the 868 megahertz to 915 megahertz 
direct sequence spread spectrum DSSS uh, where it supports 11 channels. So, you have one channel uh, which is 20 kilobit per second in the European 868 megahertz band and there are 10 channels at 40 kilobit per second in this band. Okay. So, uh, it could be so you have a channel 0 at this band and you have channels 1 to 10 in the 902 to uh, 928 megahertz band separated by about 2 megahertz. Okay. So, the second um, um, the free physical layer that we have that is the 2050 megahertz direct sequence spread spectrum. Okay. This has 16 channels. So, 16 channels uh, 250 kilobits per second in 2.4 giga, uh, gigahertz band. Okay. So, that is the uh, with the 5 giga megahertz separation that you have. Okay, that is the way this uh, frequency band is expected to operate. Coming to the MAC layer, there are three different uh, traffic types that are supported. You could have for instance periodic data for example, as it comes from sensors or it may be intermittent data for instance like light switch, you are not going to be switching on and off all the time right. Some every now and then you will do some lights you may be turned on or turned off and so on. And then uh, repetitive low latency data for instance like a mouse operation right. So, you have you will have some repetition, but it is more of a low latency data. Okay. So, to cater to these we have uh, different two different types of devices that are supported. Um, we have what are called as full function device and reduced function device okay, FFD and RFD. Now, full function device if you see it can function in any topology as we will see there are multiple topologies that are supported and it is capable of being what is called as a network coordinator and it can talk to any other device FFD or RFD. A reduced function device can work only in a limited topology that is basically only in the star topology. It cannot become the network coordinator and it only talks to FFTs to a full function device. Okay. And if you look at the address all devices must have a 64 bit IEEE address uh, and short 16 bit addresses also can be allocated in order to reduce the packet size. Because remember packet size is important right because we are looking at short packets so that is important. Okay. And if you look at the different frame types that we have, um, there is what is called as a data frame which is used for all data transfer and then there is a beacon frame. Now, the beacon frame is used by a coordinator to transmit beacons. So, a beacon frame will be transmitted so that others will respond to that. So, um, there is a beacon frame which is sent by the coordinator uh, to the others which is broadcast and then there is an acknowledgement frame which is used for confirming the successful frame uh, reception and there is a MAC command frame which is used for handling all. MAC peer entity control transfers. Okay. And in terms of transmission mode, there are two transmission modes that are supported. One is called the slotted mode and the other called the unslotted mode. The slotted mode works in the case of the beacon enabled mode that is when you have a coordinator usually sending out a beacon identifying the uh, users that are there and giving everybody a chance basically to talk. So, that is to transmit data by providing them slots. So, that is called as a slot slotted mode. So, this is used for periodic data and for repetitive low latency data. So, the unslotted mode is a non beacon enabled mode and it is useful for starting sending some intermittent data. Okay. So, these are things that we have and we said that multiple network topologies are supported in Zigbee. So, we have the star topology, you have the mesh topology and we have something called the cluster tree topology. Okay. So, you can uh, look at this uh, the yellow one you can look at as a coordinator it is a full function device and these violet colored nodes are the reduced function devices. So, this is basically how they will get connected in the different uh, topologies. Okay. So, a quick comparison of these topologies the star topology the advantage as you can see is it is easy to synchronize because there will be a central uh, controller to which all the other device will be connected and has low latency. The disadvantage is that it cannot scale very much it is a small scale okay, because the cent one fellow has to talk to so many other devices right. So, not many devices can be supported. Mesh topology you can see that there will be uh, multiple paths that are available. So, it is a robust multi hop communication network is more flexible and you will have a lower latency. The disadvantage of course, is that you will have to do a route discovery because you need to find a path to go from one node to another node. So, route discovery is important that can become costly and you need to store uh, routing tables and so on. So, you need to have storage for routing tables. So, these little devices that we have Zigbee devices they should have a storage capability as well. Uh, cluster tree this is you can see it is kind of combination of both in a sense. So, this again it will have a low routing cost because it is the cluster heads which are responsible for doing the routing and it also allows multi hop communication. So, disadvantage of course, is that the root reconstruction is costly and latency may also be quite long. So, that is with the cluster. Now, coming to a comparison of Zigbee and Bluetooth. Now, we, we already said that they are kind of used for um, pan networks in one sense, but there is a difference in terms of the applications for which they are used. Okay. So, Zigbee is meant for smaller packets over a large network. 
whereas Bluetooth is meant for larger packets over a small network. Okay, and Zigbee provides mostly uh, deals mostly with static networks with many infrequently used devices. Bluetooth, on the other hand, is more for ad hoc networks. Of course, Zigbee also supports ad hoc modes, but I say mostly static networks. Is what we said. Okay, and applications support are, main, are aimed at are basically home automation, toys, remote controls, and so on. Bluetooth is more used for file transfer, screen graphics, pictures, hands-free audio, mobile phones, headsets, you know, those kind of applications. So that is one difference as such we have between Zigbee and Bluetooth. Another comparison in terms of the uh, other features that we have. So if you look at the power profile, Bluetooth is in terms of days, whereas Zigbee will, is expected to have a power profile of the order of years, okay, at least months. Okay. And complexity, Bluetooth is much more complex, Zigbee is a much simpler protocol. So nodes per master, right? What we said, you have one central node to which many can be connected, and how many can be there in a single network, and so on. So Bluetooth, you see, in a PicoNet, we had only about seven nodes that can be connected, whereas Zigbee expects to support up to about sixty-four thousand nodes that can be supported. Latency here is the order of ten seconds. Here it's a much a smaller latency, thirty milliseconds to one second latency. Range th ten meters in Bluetooth. Here we're expecting seventy meters to three hundred meters. Extendability, uh, Zigbee is extendable, uh, not so with Bluetooth. Data rates that are supported, you can see um, Bluetooth will give you a higher data rate, whereas Zigbee is meant for a much lower data rate, 250 kilobit per second. Uh, security, uh, both support security. Bluetooth uses 64 bit and 128 bit security. Uh, Zigbee uses 128 bit AES, advanced encryption standard, and application layer security. And in terms of the um, frequency ranges and the uh, purposes for which they are used, this is more of a comparison with respect to Zigbee, Bluetooth, and other technologies as well. So, you can see that for text, graphics, and so on, um, right? In those kind of applications, 802.15.4, the Zigbee is uh, used. And uh, so, 802.11b, right, for long range communication. So you can see on this axis, I have short uh, the range that is uh, supported. So, short range to long range, right? Both can be supported with the 802.15.4. 802.11 is meant most basically for long range communication. Bluetooth, you can see, is meant for low, uh, short range communication. So, more, okay. And if you look at, if you divide it as LAN and PAN, for LAN you can have 802.11 as well as the Zigbee being used. Okay. PAN, if you look at similarly, you can use 802.15 point which is Bluetooth and you can also use a Zigbee. Right? But of course, the data rates that you have will be lower for Zigbee and you will get higher data rates for Bluetooth. Okay. So, that kind of gives you a comparison between Zigbee and Bluetooth. So, that should give you an idea of how the system. Okay. So, it gives you an idea of when you need to choose Zigbee and when you need to, ch when you need to cho choose Bluetooth, okay. that is the idea. Okay. So, to summarize, um, we have looked at two different things in this uh, session. So, we have looked at cellular networks, we have looked at the evolution from 3G to 5G, we have looked at a lot of terminology that is associated with 3G to 5G. So, in fact, we say it is an alphabet soup that we have, right? so many alphabets that are used to indicate so many different uh, terminologies that are used over there. So, we gave an idea of what those different terminologies are okay, and the basic architecture in terms of how the data transfers are handled. We also took a, had a, um, an overview of the Zigbee protocol which is used for um, low rate PAN kind of applications and so we looked at the protocol stack of Zigbee and we also saw a comparison of Zigbee with Bluetooth. Okay. So that is basically what we have done in this particular session. Thank you.